Is this thing working? All right. Hey, what's going on, YouTube? Welcome to Garnett Tools. So, it's first quarter 2020. I figure I'd come on here and share some news with you from happening around the tool industry. A lot of news is going around. A couple companies are releasing new products here. And I wanted to share with you a couple notable ones I found. So, I'll get what I'm Get what I got going here. Uh, I want to say thanks for joining me for a beer and a sandwich. See, got my sandwich here. Also got my beer. So we're gonna we're gonna get a little bit started here. So I'm not misleading you with the title. couple things I wanted to talk about. So, first things up. How's it going, New, new Level Auto? So, Ingersoll Rand, the brand we know and love with pneumatic air tools, tons of them. For years, they've been respectable pneumatic air tools. Also, they have respectable cordless battery-powered tools. They have just released uh, hand tools. So I want to know if you guys were excited about that or not. Because in today's day and age, there are a ton of tool brands out there that are just pretty much throwaway brands. So with Ingersoll Rand coming out with their new stuff, their new lineup, new new hand tools, new player in the game. I want to know how much you guys are interested and Ingersoll Rand hand tools. Now, not much of it is actually out as of now, but I can tell you that they have ratchets, they have sockets, wrenches, pliers, screwdrivers, and also tool sets, which are complete like sets that are that come just like Craftsman, the old, the old clamshells with a bunch of tools inside them. Ingersoll Rand now has stuff like that. So we go into the ratchets, right? I'm looking right at their website. Sorry, I can't really show you what I'm looking at here. Uh, but Ingersoll Rand, right? 72 tooth ratchet, $22.99. Where's that ratchet made? Who knows? There's not really much in the way of information on that particular aspect. But the quarter inch is going to be $22.99. Uh, the three eighths, $29.99. And a half inch, $37.99. Now that's going to be uh, just regular. It looks like they're regular handled ratchets. No extended ratchets, no flex hair ratchets, no long handle ratchets. And from the looks of it, they also have a 90 tooth variant. That was a 72. The 90 tooth ratchet, uh, it looks like it's gonna be $27.99 for the 90 tooth comfort grip, $37.99 for the 3 8 90 tooth comfort grip, and $47.99 for the half inch 90 tooth comfort grip. And then on the rest of the page, they have like extension bar sets, $24.99 for a three piece 10, 10 inch extension bars, which include your quarter inch, your three eighths and your half inch, three of those for $24.99. So at the prices, it looks like they're uh, offering these tools for, it looks like they're definitely gonna be Chinese made. If they're Taiwanese made, I'll be greatly surprised. It'd be a pleasant surprise, but I'd be surprised nonetheless, because for that much, you know, to consider that they're still making profit on $25 for three piece extensions, it's, ah, it's probably Chinese. So in addition to ratchets and accessories they're going to have sockets now i'm just running down a line of what they have available here so 
as far as their sockets go, they have a bunch of sets actually. Standard and deep well. So it looks like 11 piece quarter inch shallow socket set, SAE 6 point. It's going to run you $25.99. Now these sets, these sets do actually come with uh, kind of like the snap-on style, the plastic uh, holder, it looks like. That little plastic holder, which, I don't know, kind of has like a little little strange look to it. Not the one that uh, is the fully square rectangular one. Not like that, but the little plastic her, uh, holders that like organize your sockets. Like the little, like the magnetic one, Snap On has, and they sell them with sets. They look, it, they look almost the same. I mean, this is just from me telling from a picture on our website, but they look almost identical to Snap On's uh, holders that they're provided. That they usually provide when they sell you like a complete, like a quarter inch set or a three eighth set. I've seen them on plenty of Snap-on sets, and this looks to be exactly the same holder for some reason. But let me see if I can expand this information. And, uh, okay. Includes durable ther thermoform, thermoform plastic socket tray. $29.99 for the 11-piece deep. It's going to be $25.99 for the quarter-inch 11-piece shallow metric. $29.99 for the quarter-inch deep metric. So they also have 12.38s. Now, interesting enough, so... If you scroll down a tip, or there's a 10 piece, we'll, we'll go ahead and quote the metric prices. So, for metric, 3H drive, 11 piece, shallow, 12 point is going to run you 30 bucks for 11 piece. Uh, deep, 6 point metric, 40 bucks. And they all come with that holder, that, that plastic, thermoplastic holder. And. <clears throat> Until we get these in our hands or I can, you know, verify this, these look to be the same magnetic ones. Now, you can also get a 10-piece universal joint socket set, six-point. I think this is going to be, I don't know what draft size is this. What draft size is this? Okay, multiple draft sizes. So you get four quarter-inch, six three-eighths. That's a 10 piece, yeah, for 50 bucks. So Ingersoll Rand uh, has come out with tools. And I just wanna know what you guys think about it. I'm kinda in the opinion at this point that, I don't know, maybe, maybe my money is well spent elsewhere. And the interesting about, interesting thing about Ingersoll Rand is they actually used to own a tool brand. They used to own Proto. Um, so they eventually ended up selling Proto, I think, to, directly to Stanley, if I'm not mistaken, in like maybe the 80s, 70s, something like that. But I'm interested to see what these at, where these are actually made, if they're actually good. My, I'm of the opinion that they're not really that interesting to be honest because there are so many uh, tool brands out there that our market is pretty much super saturated when it comes to tools like these uh, regular sockets regular wrenches regular ratchets uh, we're just too super too saturated you know you got Harbor Freight coming out with uh, quality Taiwanese made stuff and then you have this stuff come onto the market so I'm not really sure how much interest I would, I would have into something like this. Certainly, if I seen it in a store, I would give it a look. But as far as being available online, like half of the more, I'd say like 75% of the stuff 
that they have in their hand tools section. Now you can go straight to IngersollRandTools.com or IngersollRand, or it's actually at our handtools.com and look at the same thing I'm looking at. But it looks like 80% of what they have or what's going to be available is not even available yet. You can only add certain things to your cart right now. It's just, it's just really not of interest to me. At this price point, you can walk into any Harbor Freight and get what you need to get. So I'll pause here and see what you guys are saying. Uh, see what see what you guys think about these Ingersoll Rand tools. It's a pretty big surprise to me. Like why you, you're already doing all kinds of things with uh, air tools and cordless tools. Why why step into the hand tool market? But I don't know. What do you guys think? Are you interested in it? Is it going to be something like a Tech 10? Or is it going to be something like an Icon or a Pittsburgh? Maybe they're looking at undercutting Icon tools since they're kind of like phasing out Pittsburgh at this point. I don't know. What do you guys think? What's up, Matt G6? There's tools and trash in here. There's supposed to be an upgrade to power built. Oh, really? Autobahn Dan says, both made by all trade tools. That's definitely something to look into. What's going on, Frankie M? I see Chaka Grill's got the right idea. They kind of need to stick to like air tools, cordless tools. Now, as far as their cordless tools, they seem to be like the best on the market. I'm looking at getting some myself, but on paper, they definitely seem to be killing the competition. As far as like, if you just compare some of the Ingersoll Rand cordless stuff to snap on stuff, it's just a no brainer. For the price you pay certainly warranty service is different but for the price you pay for cordless versus cordless if you're looking at a direct comparison like that ingersoll ran just blows the snap on stuff out of the water So the next thing, yeah, I actually, Matt G6, I have seen uh, Walmart's Heart brand. Now, a lot of people when that stuff first came out reported it as being Walmart's own brand. That's not really the case. Heart has been in existence for a while, and it looks like they're using the same logo as before. So I don't know if if Walmart went out and purchased that brand, I don't know if Walmart went out and licensed that brand from whoever owns them, but Hart has definitely been in business making like steel wedges, wood wedges, stuff like that, stuff of that nature for a long time, like clamps, they, stuff like that. They have been making stuff like that for a long time. A lot of it was Chinese, yeah, but yeah, whatever. Next thing I wanna switch focus on to right is milwaukee just came out with a die grinder and no i don't mean necessarily a new die grinder it's actually a straight version of their m12 die grinder so we'll switch to looking at that here and it looks like it's going to be the model 2486-20 so it says you're going to uh it's going to give you 0 0.3 horsepower. It's going to be a quarter inch straight die grinder M12. Now, and it's of course it's a fuel. So, with it being fuel, we know obviously it has a brushless motor. But I really wanted to know is something like this cost prohibitive to some of you guys out there because if we look up uh, the pricing on something like that, 
I think what I found it for was $159 for the bare tool. Bare tool. Die grinder. It's, it's just a little bit much to me. Especially when you could p go pick up a... See, here, we'll, we'll look this up. How much... How much is a... I gotta add a tab. How much is a... Uh, like a... A, a fuel... Uh, cordless... Gotta spell cord right. Cordless drill. How much is one of those? Bear tool. Tool only. A cordless fuel drill is a hundred fifty dollars. Hundred fifty bucks. Hundred forty nine ninety nine or hundred forty nine even actually. From Home Depot, you can get a fuel cordless. Is that even an M12? No, that's an M18. So let's see how much an M18 is or an M12 is. Because $159 for a damn cordless. Okay, for a cordless die grinder straight is ridiculous. I mean, that, that tool for me has got to come in under, at under 100 bucks. Absolutely. Um, we're looking at the, listen, M12 fuel, 12 volt, 120 bucks. That's a fuel actual drill. Something you're going to use like a lot, a cordless drill. And that's the drill with the half inch capacity chuck, right? That's a M12 fuel. It's yeah. Half inch capacity. So the kind of like the platform of the M18 drill in an M12 tool. 120 bucks but somehow that's bear tool granted bear tool somehow they want a hundred and fifty nine dollars for a straight die grinder two four eight six dash twenty let's see where we at where we at where we at where we at See, 2486 20. It's bear tool. $169. I'm sorry. 170 bucks for a straight straight die grinder. No batteries, no charger. Now, certainly if that if $170 gives me two batteries, even if they're the small batteries, the non uh, the non HXC non high capacity batteries even if they're the cp batteries and you give me two of those and a charger 170 is fine i'm a hundred percent on board with that but 170 dollars just for the tool is a bit much and here's here the kit the kit with the two batteries i'm talking about the two cp batteries it's the non high capacity batteries 259 $260 for a straight die grinder. What? So, for comparison, we'll look at the 2485. Two, That's the non straight one. That's the right angle die grinder. Um, if it's not the same price, I don't really even understand what they're doing. Two, what is it? Two, four, eight, five. If it's not the same price, I really don't understand what they're doing. It's it's the same price. Actually, yeah, it's the same exact price. Pretty much, you can pick them up both for the same price. So that at least makes sense. Um, let's see. So with the straight grinder, the straight, let's see, is there a RPM you can get me up to? Specifications, you have to list. Uh, they're not really listing an RPM on that guy. 
not really listing it. Maybe one of these uh, resellers will list the RPM. But I'm not really getting it. Um, for that much money, I'm definitely into something else. That's I will bear the uh, the hardship of just using a pneumatic tool for 170 bucks for a die grinder. That's not really what I'm into at all whatsoever. You actually do have four speed control on it. Uh, and it says it has 20% more power than a pneumatic. I really want to know the RPM on that die grinder to justify 0.3 horsepower. Eh, I don't really know um, how they're measuring that. Or, But yeah, that's the second of the, the three things I have to talk to you guys about. So... Let me know. <laughs> okay, so Autobahn Dan says the handle on the angle diagrammer is ginormous. Same as the straight ones. Might as well, actually, he said you, you're better off getting a straight one. Um, I, t I mean, or actually, I messed that up. He says, you're better off getting an M18. It looks like it's the same handle on the regular right angle one. Looks exactly, uh, there's a slight variation, but there doesn't look to be too much of a difference. I mean, of course, the uh, your battery still fit in the same slot. So of course that portion of the tool is gonna be the same size. So yeah. As, right, A. Murray. I'd probably stick with air before buying something like this at 170 bucks. Maybe in like three years when they lower the price to like under 100 for the bear tool at like Home Depot's Black Friday in 2024 or whatever. Maybe I'll pick it up because it would be pretty cool. But other than that, yeah, I'll just, uh, it's not really, that's the problem with something like this. It's not really something you would need. Yeah, the tool guy, Ty, you're absolutely right. So a die grinder is not necessarily like a first need. Something like an impact or a drill or a driver, those are definitely your priorities. But even when it comes to your secondary ones, you would want like the cutoff tool or like the uh, soldering gun or the heat gun or the temp gun, stuff like that. The die grinder is like third or fourth list of wish wishes that you would want. Yes, people said they wanted this, but not for 170 bucks for the bear tool. It's not what we wanted. All right, so we're gonna switch gears here, and <laughs> that's actually a unintended pun. But SK Tools, SK Tools has just released, actually not just, um, they have released the rest, the remaining low profile ratchets. So SK now has a full lineup of teardrop ratchets, low profile 92 teardrop ratchets, full lineup. So um, the first, we're going to go over the new ones, then I'll just uh, pepper in at the end of the ones they already had. So, new new for their new release is going to be the 80280 5-inch flex head quarter inch drive. Also new in that lineup is the 80181 quarter inch 8 inch fixed head. There's also another quarter inch drive, the 80182 quarter drive, 12 inch fixed head. Now, why they didn't come out with a flex head on that when all their other competitors do, I'm not really sure. But I mean, uh, let's see, Mac has one, a nine inch flex head. Snap-on has a 12 inch flex head. I think Cornwell also has a 12 inch flex head. 
So uh, they sh- kind of should have. They kind of should have walked, uh, ran up to like twelve, at least nine inch for flex head. But in a quarter inch, you're only getting a five inch flex head. That's the only option. In three H drive, we got an eleven inch flex head. We also got a four inch fixed head, an eleven inch fixed head, and a fifteen inch fixed head. Again, actually no. There's also, nope, nope, that's it, that's it. In 3 8 there's only the 11 flex, the 4 inch fixed, the 11 fixed, that's it. Actually, 15 fixed. Why they didn't at least make the 3 8 15 fixed, I mean, flex head, should have at least made that 15 inch flex head. That would have put them in line with the competitors because all their competitors have a 17 inch flex head. So, a little bit befuddlement there, but in half inch drive, we have a 15 inch flex head. We have a 10 inch fix head. Actually, uh, that's one of the ones I should have added to the end. A 15 inch flex head, a 15 inch fixed head, and a 24 inch fixed head. Again, skipping out on that 24 inch flex head. So, I'm wondering if they couldn't get them up to the spec they wanted and really couldn't uh, get them to be durable or reliable at those lengths and they chose to uh, introduce the flex heads at lower lower leverage lengths but that makes for let's see we got one two three that's six there uh, six 13 total ratchets in SK's LP90 lineup now um, that's, that's it. So the same, the ones we had before, well, originally the only one, the first one to come out was the 80200, the eight inch fixed head, three inch drive. Then they came out with the five inch fixed head, quarter inch. Then they came out with the 10 inch fixed head, half inch drive. So it was only three ratchets. Initially there was only one ratchet. Then there was uh, three ratchets, only the standard lengths. Now we have the whole lineup. We have stubby ones, we have long ones, to, and we have flex head ones. Now, the only, the only real downside to all of this, a lot of guys will say that they should have came out with knurled handles. I don't believe that's the case. I think they did right by sticking with the chrome handle. The chrome handle is absolutely... What most mechanics will want, maybe the more industrial guys, maybe the guys who have been fans of SK for 20, 30 years, maybe they want knurled handle ratchets. But as far as uh, for the new customer, for the the potential buyer, uh, the chrome handle is where is how you want to go. It's definitely the only the only other option in the marketplace for a knurled handle is Proto. So you're not really you're not really trying to compete with them at this point. They're going more after mechanics with introducing stuff like this, uh, ratcheting wrenches and coming out with their mobile tool trucks. So the only real downside to this is that they didn't come out with a comfort grip. I don't know why they didn't come out with a comfort grip because they most certainly should have. But uh, what do you guys think? Mm, seems I missed the super chat. Come on. Where is the chat box at? There we go. <laughs> Ryobi is trash. Chaka Grill says. Now, eh. Oh, and I also wanted to do something else at the end of this live stream. I only have about half an hour left. All right. Cool. So, if you want me, if you guys want me to do like recommendations like I used to do, because it was kind of fun back in the day. When you guys would ask for whatever you guys wanted or were looking to buy, and I would just scour the web and see what I could find for the best 
what I would consider by in that uh, sort of area of tool. Ah, uh, maybe I'll, 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 if you guys want me to do that, sure, I'll do it. But um, thanks for the for the two dollars Chaka Grills. I hope I'm saying that right. But right, he says Ryobi is trash, which uh, I gotta tend to, I gotta agree with you on that one. Um, as far as tool lineup, they're not really, not really interesting at all to me, at least. Certainly. If you were a homeowner and you weren't really in the tools, they definitely have their place. Let me just say that. Put that out there in the universe. They definitely have their place for the entry-level homeowner who's going to sit it on a shelf and use it twice a year. Go for that product because it's the cheapest one out there, still has a warranty, whatever. But if you're going to be using the tool, you're going to want to step up a bit in uh, kind of like level because Ryobi is almost the lowest level. They're not the lowest level. I could tell you that Harbor Freight, uh, some of those cheap, cheap ass Harbor Freight drills, the, the super, super just you open a box and it smells like China. Those are the worst Ever. then you step up in level like I, I'd say how do I put this Ryobi is probably above everything at Harbor Freight except for what is their uh, whatever they got that impact line in what is their impact line Let's see here. Uh, it's not Bauer. It's whatever that impact is. Power tools. What's the impact? The big impact they got. Earthquake. So, Ryobi is probably better than everything and except Earthquake. Now, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, Harbor Freight Power Tools still only have like that 90-day warranty, which is... <laughs> How they get you. That's how they get you. But yeah. Um, so let's let's see what we got here. Let's pop up this chat. Really interested in the SK stuff since you posted that video a while ago. Yeah, Michael uh, Pine, the the SK, the, that SK ratchet that I posted actually went back and looked at the video info. That was done over two years ago. So, uh, but I think that ratchet's still pretty cheap, like 60 bucks. Uh, decent tap and die set. Now, uh, for that, it's absolutely gonna be uh, Urban Hansen. Um, there are others. So there's a Whittier GTD. And something like that, I would, I would, I wouldn't uh, not go Chinese. I would not, unless you're looking at a price point. If you put your, uh, if you're putting your a tab and die set in a certain price point, then just go get Gear Wrench. Uh, it'll be cheap enough on Amazon. Or whatever that it'll still work and you got whatever warranty they provide but if you need a very good tap and die set that all your stuff is going to be warrantied i would definitely go erwin um erwin hansen mm -hmm. and you can find that stuff you can get it at Nap like napa and, uh, i think granger zorro 
So a lot of those places will have like sales every once in a while. But another one uh, I would uh, look at is Witty on GTD. Those, those are the only other taps I've had experience with. And I got a lot of them from Granger. So they're also a, an American made. So, so the Irwin taps and Daz uh, usually are made in America. But I don't know if Witty or, or will make sets. That's the issue. A lot of these taps companies, they don't really make sets. They supply, they manufacture and supply taps, but they don't really sell sets to consumers. That's not really their business model. They do stuff for machining and all this other stuff. So as far as a set, a lot of the manufacturers won't actually, the, the best tap manufacturer in the world doesn't make a set. You got to go out and build your set. So unfortunately, that's about the the advice I can get. There's, um, as far as, uh, I've seen in here, Snappy, Snappy, uh, Snappy is Erwin. Snap on might be Erwin, but as far as I could remember, some of their drills and taps, actually, the set, okay, the set of taps and dies are Irwin, I think, but it's when you switch over to the other products like drills, left hand drills and extractors, I think those are made by Precision Precision Twist, and they're not Irwin. Tom Gun, a lot of Irwin, so that's a that's kind of like a loaded question. Irwin, certain Irwin products are still made in America. Not all of them. Probably not the majority of them, actually. But as far as drill bits and stuff, they're still made in America. But like I said, not all of them. So you kind of got to be vigilant and checking for that. You got to keep an eye out. Because they'll definitely try to pull the wool over your heads. Duralas going to China and a power torque. Now being not China, I'm more China. What's so I don't really uh have many O'Reilly's at my in my area. I haven't been in one in years. Uh there was one over on the side that I used to live, but it's probably like an hour drive from where I live. Yeah, I have no, no experience with Pirate Torque whatsoever. Now, I did, I did have a look at Titan. One day I was in, I think it was an Advance. Or maybe an AutoZone. And I walked past the counter and I got them right up in the, at the counter. And it looks like they have like a machined or billet aluminum handle on them the 90 tooth and they're relatively cheap stuff like that in like a store like a part store is good because you walk past it you see it and definitely they're playing to your towards your impulse buy habits that, you know, stores, grocery stores, whatever store Walmart has conditioned you to do. You walk past it, you're like, ooh, what's that? That's how to get you. But 
certainly stuff like that, uh, tight with the Titan Ratchet. If Ingersoll Rand took that approach and started like putting them places, maybe it might have interest. But other than that, I kind of like, eh, I kind of wouldn't look into it at all. But the Titan Ratchet did look good to me. It was more interesting than Ingersoll Rand tools, I can tell you that. See, you're talking about power torque, huh? I'm surprised people doesn't don't make more of a deal out of uh, out of gear wrench being replaced by that uh, TEQ in advanced auto because every time I walk past it, it just looks like. It's gear wrench stuff still. Yeah, I, I'm surprised more people don't make big of a deal because it's for years. Uh, Advance Auto has been gear wrench. Years. I think when I first started wrenching, gear wrench was still in, still in, uh, Advanced Auto. Yeah. Yeah, TEQ is Apex Tool Group. Yeah, I expected that. But that that opens up an, an avenue because if Advanced Auto owns actually owns the brand TEQ, then they could source whatever they want to. Just food for thought. Just gross. Yeah. I kind of don't like... I don't like Apex Tool Group. I mean, as far as a, a company outsourcing egregiously, they're, they're the absolute top worst offender. Killing American jobs. As far as tool companies go, Apex is the worst offender. Yeah, true, true to that, Hard Knocks. Apex has absolutely just killed so many brands, it's ridiculous. Yeah, Performance Tool actually has some good products sometimes. So, have any of you guys had this Kentucky Bourbon Ale? It's pretty good stuff. If you're just joining me, I'd like to say thank you. No. Let me finish my thought. I'd like to say thank you for joining me with a beer and a sandwich. You, Of course, you get a deli sandwich. You gotta get the pickle. You got to. Look at that. Ooh, that's a pickle. Look at that. 
That's a pickle. Alright. So let me let me see here. Apex no. Nah. Chuck of Grills. Gills. Gillis. I gotta disagree with you, buddy. That's okay. America made. Been in business for hundred a hundred years. Much better than Apex. Product to product. I mean, like a one for one comparison. SK kills Apex. If you took a straight non reversible ratcheting wrench and compared it to an X frame. That's a pretty unfair battle. <laughs> SK kills that. 216 positions in their ratcheting wrenches to compared to gear wrenches what? 72. When you look at their ratchets, their ratchets are more low profile. Now that SK has come out with their actual low profile lineup. Now granted, Apex or gear wrench has a ton more ratchet options than SK ever, ever even had. But if you told me regular handle, standard length ratchet, I'd pick SK every time. It seems that every time a uh, Asian manufacturer wants to compete in this type of space and they want to make like a ratchet or something what they do is they make it more bulky and that's because the i think it's because their metal is weaker and i think it's that they need that more thickness in their metal because it's weaker to be as strong as our counterparts it's just a theory <laughs> See, Chaka, even though I disagree with you, that's just, I don't know, I'm trying to, I guess I'm trying to chew my own horn now. Even though I disagree with you, I wasn't like coming at you. Even though you were playing and I disagreed, it's all, it's all cordial here. You can have your opinion, I can have my opinion. I ain't saying I'm an expert or anything. I'm just saying, I'm telling you my opinion. Why not, Drew's Auto? More power tools? John Gibson loves his X frames. Pink League 22 says, take a SK wrench versus a gear wrench combo and you'll feel the difference. Just started at a lube joint. The guys there hate on me for my snap-on long ratcheting double flex. Hey, listen. If you got, if you, listen, you got probably the best tool you probably got overkill for that job you got it for a deal if you got it passed down or you outright bought it whatever that's like the best they could they could hate all they want to they just hate him <laughs> if you got a snap on ratcheting double flex they hate they're hating they're, that's the only thing it's like you got a BMW and they got a Chrysler. That's that's pretty much what's going on there. I auto bond in. I could never figure out why. If you have the open beam of an X frame, right? So you got the the beam of the wrench here, 
right? Then you got the opening right here. Then you got the rest of the, the ratchet here, right? Why not just make it flex head? Just port this or cut this part out and make the joint right at the two open parts and put a flex head mechanism right there. Easy, easy. You're killing everybody. The biggest downfall I think of the X-Frames are them being six point. It's just, they should have been 12 point. Sorry. They should have absolutely been 12 point. There's no, there's no way, unless it was an engineering decision and I kind of had to go with the six point over the 12, should have been 12 point. Granted, a lot of people like six point, but I, I hear from many people that say that those wrenches being six point is exactly the reason they don't buy them. They needed to be 12 point. Blind, when you're trying to get at and access something blind, six point is hell. When you're trying to reach your hand behind somewhere and get at something, six point is hell. Did you ever say why you don't use tools much anymore, Drews? Yeah, Mountain Cop or Mountain Carlisle. I think it's Mountain Carlisle Platinum Easy Red. A lot of them use Cabo. Diagnostics, there you go. That's what's up. I do a lot of that myself, but I'm still, I still turn wrenches. Sucks for me. be right John Gibson but I don't know a lot of people kind of a lot of people kind of wanted 12 point like if those were 12 point they would be on a lot more technicians hands this pickle looks good Also got to disagree with you John Gibson because if you think back to points now I've had I'm only I'm gonna tell you my age I'm only 28 okay and I've had the misfortune of having to deal with points ignition systems and I tell you what I would take a coil on plug ignition system 10 times before I took a points ignition system. It's just, it's set by the computer. If a sensor goes bad, as far as ignition system, not much can go bad that tells it, hey,
hey, don't run. But as far as points, you got to set the dwell. You got to set the gap. You got to make sure all your stuff in there is clean. You got to, there's that little, uh, there's that little capacitor or whatever thing inside that thing, inside the distributor when it comes to that point system. So I think uh, a lot of the computer stuff has made specifically the engine more reliable it's just that the check engine light comes on for more things i i think a lot of engineers have gone like overboard and engineering stuff that necessarily doesn't need to be engineered like when you're when you're doing like dual overhead cams and the valve train, valve, uh, the chain drive is all crazy and that's just unnecessary. You could do an overhead cam engine, right? Or an overhead valve engine with coil one plug and make it fuel efficient. They've done it. It's, that's all you need. You don't need all kinds of stuff and turbos, twin turbos, one turbo feeding another turbo and all kinds of other stuff. Yeah. Okay. So there you're right. Okay. So yeah, my disagreeance was with the engine. So as far as the engine today, it's better than it was. Engines are more reliable because if you went if you went on a trip from say where i'm at in pittsburgh to colorado back in like the 80s 70s your engine will run different in colorado not the case today your engine once it gets to that elevation it's sensing all the stuff that's going on with the barrow it knows how to adjust to run right in that environment back then it didn't so but when it comes to the car itself <laughs> yeah you're right they've complicated things i think the golden years were like uh, uh probably 2000 to 2010 where it was like peak good okay they were still doing a stuff where you had to program your radio back then, but it wasn't as bad. Um, I mean, you still, they're still doing stuff like that today. Ah, well, and I think in that case, we'll say peak was like 05. 05 was like peak, peak, you know what I'm saying? But I don't know. Come on, chat. Well, it depends on EJM. Usually when it, that was like a, a dummy light, I think, as far as OBD2 goes. Speaking of that, where the hell is OBD3? It's been way too long. They should have had that out by now. But um, as far as the, the fuel the fuel light, that's a, like a dummy light. So it's looking for an EVAP leak. In fact, I have one of those on my, on my truck. There's an EVAP leak. Now the first thing it's gonna do is say, hey, was your gas cap open? Did you, did you forget to put the gas cap on, you idiot? Listen, dummy, next time you're at a gas station, Put your gas cap on. <laughs> That's what that light is saying. But I think that uh, when it pressurizes the EVAP system, it's looking for large leaks, small leaks, general leaks. That's just one of them it picks up. 
Um, if you have if you have a small evap leak, it's gonna think that your gas cap is open. And then if it persists, then it's gonna be like, okay, your gas cap's not open. You just got a problem. So then it's gonna set a different code. Actually, the gas cap sometimes sometimes it'll warn you about the gas cap without setting the code. But once it sets the code, it's saying, like, listen, you got issues, buddy. Yeah, you got that right, John. Those days are gone. Swapping engines, putting whatever. Absolutely the truth. So. Yeah, Autobahn Dan, I'm, I'm definitely, this is why you see me, I'm in a hotel right now. This is not my house. <laughs> I wish it was. Everything would be clean every day. But, uh, I'm, I'm learning about, I'm in class for diesel emission stuff. Right now. And on fork trucks, when it comes to diesel emissions, we have to deal with the same regulations as over the road trucks. So tier four just swaps over to our industry too. guys about 15 I'll give you guys a 10 15 because I got to get in class and get in bed I know I love pickles EJM I love pickles some pickles like I, I hate the Mount Olive pickles those are gross to me but like Clausen's or Nathan's delicious can't beat them. Can't beat them. But if any of you guys need a recommendation, yeah, some fork trucks, some tier four final fork trucks have death fluid. Uh, I think tier four interim doesn't have death fluid. They were using passive uh, regen systems. But yeah, we have to deal with death systems. Yeah, yeah, it is what it is. <coughs> you got to pay to play, right? Plastic oil pans, no, have not seen that. I don't anticipate that ever coming to our industry. You know why? Because forklift operators run over stuff all the time constantly they don't give a damn they see something on the road i'm in a fork truck who cares it's not my fork truck who cares runs it over um it's like that with plastic bags it's like that with whole parts that are you know this big it's bigger than my head they'll run it over they don't general in general they don't care so you put a plastic oil pan no, no, no. One of a forklift, it's it's gonna be bad news. Definitely. Um 
I would at that point I would probably personally stock plastic oil pants and sell them back to my company. <laughs> Yep, yep. Yep. Pinkley got it right. Now, see, but the, the problem is with forklift operators, right, is that with over-the-road trucks, right, you get a certification every so often. You redo your uh, CDL or whatever, all right? And that's just because how big the truck is, safety rules, where you have to stop, how you have to stop, stuff like that. Um, being safe for the other drivers, all this stuff like that. Forklift operators get trained once, that's it, for the most part. And it's up to the company's discretion if they want to train their operators yearly or whatever. Because they might not do it ever. Uh, companies might not train any forklift operators ever. They might, you know, just say up. Oh. You know, there might be a union shop and they bid out on a forklift gig and they get it. Hey, $2 raise, go ahead. That's it. <laughs> or there might be actual no we train you now technically uh technically you have to train once a year to get recertified now every every forklift operator shall be certified or and qualified to operate that piece of equipment but it's not always necessarily the case Find the guy off the street, hop on his truck. <laughs> yep, that's 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 how some people do it. <laughs> yeah, hard knocks, that's that's definitely stuff I have to deal with. So it depends on your braking system that this happens sometimes. Sometimes it's not a deal. But if you have a certain type of braking system where you have a dry brake braking system and maybe uh, you have external lines just like a car and you run over a plastic bag and a car who gives a shit, right? I mean, there's so much air under, so much space underneath that car, it might just fly out the back. But it seems every forklift <laughs> just traps, traps, I, I mean, probably coupled with the low speed that a forklift travels at, it traps a plastic bag around the drive wheels. Drive wheels are in the front, brakes are in the front, so sometimes you get a plastic bag wrapped around the whole axle and the brake line, which breaks the brake line, which then turns into no brakes. Well, you guys have been running, uh, Mr. Customer, you guys have been running over your plastic, the, the scraps from your plastic wrapping machine. Uh, <laughs> and especially, it's fun when it's like a rental, and you gotta tell them like, like hey, you gotta stop doing that because this costs you money. You already pay, they already pay for a rental agreement or whatever. This costs you additional money. Like this this whole bill was going, to, we're gonna send you an invoice because of you're running over plastic on a consistent basis and it's wrapping around an axle and breaking stuff. Sometimes that plastic will even go into the drum and then you got <laughs> if you can imagine this, you got brake friction material, drum, plastic in between there. It's a fun time. 
And uh, most forklifts are not like cars. You can't just jack it up, take the wheel off. There's one brand that's like that. Jack it up, take the wheel off, take the drum off. Brakes are right there. Most brands, you jack it up, take the wheel off, unbolt the axle, drain the axle. Sometimes you gotta uh, take out the gears that are at the end there. Sometimes you don't. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's you're talking about like a five hour job just to just cause you've been running over plastic worst off worst damage I've seen one operator do to a unit Ugh, that's a tough one. I didn't see a lot of damage. Um, hmm. Well, okay. T uh, do you mean, okay, we, we, there's two ways I can interpret that. Uh, most catastrophic. Actually, <laughs> there's not two ways I can interpret it. It's the same truck. Now, this truck in particular costs over $300,000. It's definitely a lift truck. And uh, let's see, the operator ran one of the wheels, I guess wasn't paying attention or something. One of the drive wheels, so you got your drive wheels in the front. Um, this, this particular unit didn't have a regular carriage on it. So the drive wheels are exposed. So anything like, if you stood in a path of one of these drive wheels, you would get run over. On a normal forklift, the if you're looking at it from the front, the carriage and the load backrest kind of like obscure the drive wheels. That's not the case on this unit. The drive wheels are exposed, uh, and the attachment is like only like in the center of the truck. So the the wheels are off to the side. So the operator ran this three hundred thousand over three hundred thousand dollar truck into a steel beam for a, a, a building, and that <laughs> we got into tearing that apart, and uh, it broke. It actually broke the axle. So these are Dana axles. And uh, through the manufacturer, it's ninety thousand dollar. Yeah, nine zero thousand dollar axle replacement job. So that was probably the worst damage I've ever seen to a truck. Hard knocks, I can't say I've ever had to do that. Yep, all 100% builds the customer too, because uh, yeah, that's not our fault. <laughs> you did that. So, yep. The bill to fix this forklift is more than the Corvette, sir. <laughs> um, Hard Knocks, that was a union job, so. Yeah, see, that's not that bad. Uh, I used to work at a steel mill, and I've seen, I seen it all. I've seen uh, carriages, the carriage stop is broke. So what happens is when the carriage goes up max, it's not touching a stop because the chains are adjusted a certain way that... It never hits that stop, and max lift never touches that stop. Well, I've seen trucks where that stop is gone because the carriage has been hitting it so much. So when they run it up max, the, the whole carriage falls out of the mast. Yeah, and it's, it's hell to get back in there.
Yeah, dude, I would never... Listen, if you told me to work on a meat room truck with live anim or dead animals all over it, I tell you no. To be honest, I would... Listen, listen. You got to take this thing back to... The, like, unless it was something simple, like a horn or like a basic tune-up or something like that, anything else, I'm like, you got to take this thing to the shop because... We'll pressure wash it and clean it out, but I'm not working on with you know chicken gizzards falling all over me. It's not it's not my MO today. But do you guys have anything? Alright, so we're at the end of my rope here. It's about time for me to go ahead, go to bed. Do you guys have anything you need recommendations on? If not, I'm going to turn it in. Got a 7.30 start tomorrow. <clears throat> Got some more learning to do throughout the week. So. What kind of forklifts? Uh, hard knocks. See you later, Miss Fick. EJM, you take it easy too, my dude. Oh, Heister. Yeah, you know, I used to work on all of those. Were they new Heisters? If they were renting, they were new Heisters. So you guys had meat Heisters? Oh, man. That must have been hell. Because I know those systems ain't really... Once you get them... Once you can get those systems in somewhere with some dust and it start packing up and the auto sensors and the harnesses. Oh. That whole... That whole heister system is like... It's all CAN bus. It's like... It's like worse than a car. Cause you get a CAN bus communication area error, you're done. Truck's done. Go back and see uh, if I missed anything. Well, all right, fellas. I want to say thank you for sticking with me. Thank you for joining me for a beer and a sandwich. How's it going, beer foot? Unfortunately, I'm getting off of here. I got to sign off, get my ass in bed. But thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for sticking around. Uh, let me know what you think about this video down in the comments. Uh, just let me know what you think about Milwaukee's air die grinder and SK's uh, new ratchet lineup and <coughs> also Ingersoll Rand's new hand tools. But that's it. Thanks for watching. I really do appreciate it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.